started here all right uh we are on chapter seven of the cloven tree uh, i'm just gonna settle right back on in here and get into it it the chapter is 22 pages so it'll take us about an hour all right so chapter seven the kilia how's my sound okay Spending less than three days near Beech Grove, the soldiers moved on toward the northeast, passing the broken rocks of the trackless wastes that separated the northern Fenlands from the southern section of the Kilia. Owen was surprised by the speed of the departure, and he asked Lord Thames about it. After the incident you had with those priests, you're complaining about leaving early? No, my lord, but I thought that... Wait a minute, sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry, I kind of lost track. Uh, no, my lord, but I thought that we'd replenish our supplies completely. The quartering parties, that's the term? Thanks, hardly, uh, hardly replaced what we used at all, and I didn't mean to offend the priests. I thought bellicose was a polite version of cursing instead of saying... Owen floundered to a halt as he realized that he was going to say the very offensive curse for which bellicose was a substitute. Thames laughed. Priests in general are a touchy lot, and Beechgrove's priests of the pa patient god are perhaps the touchiest of them all. They are excellent healers, however, and unlike many pantheistic priests, they will minister to any wound and worry about faith later. Pantheistic? What does that mean? Owen asked. Thames blinked. 
Don't worry about it. We were going to leave Beech Grove quickly, no matter what our supply state. Strictly speaking, that city is part of my king's domain, but they have a very long history of autonomy, of governing themselves. Neither the High kings nor the iron kings before them like to put much pressure on the population there, nor do they, he said after a pause, and Owen wondered what other word he would have said, nor do they like to remind the beach beach grovers too much that they that they have a king again. Sorry, some of this um Dialogue is a little bit hard to follow sometimes. Because from the collapse of the Midland Iron Kings until the High King was crowned, they had no monarch, Owen said, remembering one of the lessons the wizards drilled into him while traveling to Marshburg. Precisely. When Therian was crowned High King just over a thousand years ago, they ruled themselves in that city for over ten times that long. We had to have fewer supplies, though, for practical reasons. We were too weighted down in the fens. It couldn't be helped, but now that we're reaching grazing lands, we don't need so many supplies, and we'll be more mobile when we reach the Kilia. The pace of the journey was much more swift once they had passed the southernmost city of the Midlands that now bore the first High King's name. Owen was told that they would reach the broken hills of the Kilia within ten days, and three days out of Beech Grove the column divided. The prince and his general were taking a more northerly course as the captain that had accompanied the royal to Fentown led his column to the northeast. Owen still trained, but Curtis made sure that he only practiced when he could do it properly. You're new enough with it yet that if you start doing it wrong, you might forget how, the old soldier said, wanting to stop any argument before it started. Owen simply nodded. He'd done the same thing when he was teaching his younger siblings about the fens. Besides, he wanted his new blisters to heal. So, Owen had few activities for the days that, had, that he had grown accustomed to having filled with training. He asked questions, wanting to avoid another legionnaire misunderstanding. The, new, the, the men of the unit were sick of his questions, so Curtis had him ask the elves and dwarves. Most of them were too busy with their own preparations, but Owen found a surprisingly avid and available teacher in Lelebrun. When Owen asked him about spending so much time teaching him, the elf replied, I have done all that I can for now. Until we deploy, I have nothing to do but observe. Captain, Owen said, how's the Bane Lord... How's the Bane Lord cause our souls to diminish? And does he try it with elves and dwarves? Good question, young Owen. His power to attack the souls of the elder races is less. Mine, mine experience teaches me. We have achieved our maturation. Man hath not. Like metal that's been tempered? Owen asked. Exactly, Owen. The comparison is perfect. He expended much effort to derive the foul races from elder stock without corrupting their, them entirely. Yet humanity, not yet mature, offered him far different opportunities. As to how he limited thy kind, man hath been divided, and so doth diminish. That can't be all he did, Owen said. Did he magically curse us or something? Owen waved his hand in an expansive gesture. Lillibrand smiled. The motion seemed childlike to him. Perhaps, but the division among men certainly did not help souls, help human souls. War among brothers is the most harmful of all soul-harming conflicts. No war is good for the soul, but killing one of thine own kind, this changes thee forever. When the Bane Lord uprose, one monarch, the Iron, ruled men. The Bane Lord's first aim was to to end this unity, and now men war with men. There beeth other soul burdens, like famine, plague, and pestilence, which often accompany war. 
the mere fact that thou wouldst fear a strange community of thine own race is a burden, Owen, as in the fact that war causes waste and stress, both of which are also deadly to the health and a burden on the soul. But the lives of men and women the Bane Lord shortened greatly. If thy span of years doth be halved, thy soul loseth half its growth, and he achieved this with every deceit he had. Most men of this age live for a century or less. Live for a century, Owen interjected. No man in the fens is eighty. Lelebrin started. Then it is a hard life. Half the men of the angle reach eighty. Half of those men reach a century. But men of old oft times reached twenty-five decades without any magic at all. How how did he cut his that down to less than fifty years in places? Fifty years, Lelebrin looked Lelebrin looked appalled. Division, mistrust, strife, hatred, and other things, each a more powerful curse than than that magic thou dost seem to think might be involved in everything. He grinned quickly at Owen's blush. More now men breed more and far earlier than is the actual age of human maturity, and this ends thy youth prematurely. The soul, like the body, grows fastest when it is young. Men once spent long years of youth, male and female of thy kind, for the term man should be applied to both, and the terms for thy gender alone are forgotten. In a season of... Uh, in a season of youth where the soul matured yet remained young... When the soul is truly young, the body reflects this, and the decay of aging is slowed. Now this war-torn world, where there are so many burdens for the human soul, cannot provide as well as the ancient world before the Bane Lord's uprising. Thy people must expend their youth like a gambler expending coin. Man hath dwindled back unto the ancient days of long before the time of thwarted maturation, the time that began with the first obsidian king, and ended when Brian was the iron, with the Bane Lord's uprising. Yet the potential of the human soul doth remain. Could man recover what he hath lost, and remember what that time gave him that he hath forgotten? Ugh. Okay, I need a sip after that. Some of this is tough to read. Owen thought about what he said, noting that he might name some of the soldiers youthful but not young, not even Blister and Hot Hands, nor Arthur or Rorhan. He thought of the screaming night terrors his three oldest mothers had had, knowing that they had been abused as w women slaves, and seeing a dark, terrible light in his father's eyes whenever that had occurred, a light that did not fade for days. And he thought of the terror those dreams inspired in him and his older sisters, oldest sisters and brothers. He thought of how his father had worked and all their mothers had worked to take care of them, and how his cousin's dreams had been dashed when Uncle Gawain had died. He thought of how his father had worried for his children, and he knew that there was more than a grain of truth in the elf's words. Those things were all burdens on the soul, he knew. Still, he could not fathom such a long life. Well, I don't know about living for that long, but why can't you just teach me what I don't know? What men have forgotten? Lelebrin, Lelebrin looked long at the 30-year-old Fen Hunter. Several times he started to speak. Finally, he said, I would that it were that simple, Owen. Lelebrin became absorbed in thought, and Owen knew the elf would not talk any more for a while. He let the matter drop. The terrain they had reached was new to Owen. He had seen pine trees before, but never so many, or so many kinds, nor at so low an altitude. It was the water that was the newest experience to him, however. He had never seen so much water that wasn't stagnant. He reveled in the scent of the streams they passed. "'Why are you breathing so deeply, Owen?' Taurus asked. "'The water,' he replied. 
It's clean. Always before, it smelled of the swamps, the cistern, or the sea. Ahem, Taurus said. The rest of the day was given over to inspections, as each man, elf, and dwarf would have to rely upon the gear that they took when they left the column and would have limited spares. Curtis and Lelebrin anxiously followed Brander as he slowly gave a very keen look at each member's equipment. Why is the dwarf captain the chief of the inspection? Owen asked Sergeant Wilmer. Curtis had made the soldiers practice inspecting each other's gear, his own every day, and a few others. The dwarves had not been part of that, though. Inspecting officer on parade, Wilmer corrected. Dwarves have a feel for craftsmanship, an instinct for it. They know iron and steel better than any man or elf, and a dwarf can carry more gear than any three men. Now be quiet. You're supposed to be at attention. Owen slowly watched as Brander, looking like an iron statue in his armor, full dwarven plate, above chain, above leather, made suggestions for the other mission members, from their boots to their helmets. Here a knife would be too old of a hilt. What? Uh, a there a bowstring would need to be replaced, or this man's boots were too worn to survive, and the raid if they had to run. After nearly two hours, Brander came to Owen. Owen's pack was a little light upon supplies and extra clothing, but the gear there was excellent, Brander noted. Owen had four extra pairs of shoes, which even the dwarf thought excessive, but he was impressed with Owen's ember kit, his first aid kit, which could have made a seamstress jealous, and with the leathers from which Owen had made his gear and armor. Were we not going on a mission, I would offer you gold for these hides. I am tempted to in any event. You might want to try putting chain over it, but I will not require that. Now, show me your weapons. This was the most critical part of the inspection. A soldier could have a great kit but without well-kept weapons, he was as fierce as a landed shark. Again, Owen did well. The crossbows he carried were similar to portable dwarven ballistae, but Owen had a quick tension release upon all of his that made it possible for a very strong man to reload the bows almost instantly. Owen's three knives were adequate, though Brander insisted that he add one that was made of steel and not just bone. The dwarf was very troubled, however, about the sword Owen had been given. Curtis was right. You should not have bent it like you did. It will serve, but now it is stressed, so that if used too harshly, it will fail, dwarf steel or not. He signaled to one of his sons, and Tildor, also in full armor, brought an axe out of the wagon stores, a large two-handed, two-bladed axe that most men would have would have to wield two-handed. Use this as well. You have some skill with this kind of blade. That night, Master Andoran, who had accompanied the, accompanied the captain's column, gave him a final briefing. The Kilia is under the nor nominal overlordship of Kruchark, one of the warlords who form the Heptarchy. They are constantly wary of other Pettibanes, which does not mean that the Heptarchs trust each other much more than they do the rest. In any case, we have no reason to believe that Kruchark knows of what Brask and Krolf have found. Be certain that be certain that he hath discovered it, Master Andoran, De Doran interjected. Kruchark hath cunning, and he hath never been a fool. Yes, he's not a person to underestimate. As I was saying, he may not know of the book, but if he does, he is hiding it well. There are three banner companies of legionnaires who patrol the Kilia in an intricate but regular pattern. Up until last month, when I went out of contact of my sources, they were still patrolling the routes that they have used since we started monitoring them years ago. Other than these legionnaires, the Heptarchs cannot afford to station any unifying presence in this region. 
their balance with the rest of the petty banes does not leave them any extra troops for such a garrison. This still leaves the garrisons of the dozen or more warlords of the Kilia itself, but only Kroger's, Kroger's garrison is known to patrol, never extensively. Once you have entered the Kilia, you will seek places where you can enter the tunnels of Oxbow's old guerrilla days. If I read the archived briefings correctly, the three best entrances are here, here, and here. Is that correct, Captain Oxbow? The older Owen glanced to the points and Doran had marked on the map. Yeah, they're the ones that should still be a secret. There are others I don't want to think about. He blew out a breath. Which one do you want to us to use. If Curtis's memory serves, this one would be best, as it's central to both targets, Andoran said, but because of the Legion Company's patrol routes, I recommend that you use this one. He moved to the second point on the map. The first point has Legion men passing within a furlong of it every three to six days. The second point usually doesn't have the undead within a mile of it. Often they're over a league away, Oxbow nodded appreciatively and the third point while the best of them found an underground perspective is too close to Kroger's lair to risk his patrols good thinking master Andoran this reminded Thal of his question why is Kroger the only one of them that have patrols Lord Thames answered since the time of the Killian raiders that Oxbow captained, the warlords of the Kilia have been independent of each other. Gant was the last to rule the region after he deposed Krauger as chief vassal. Krauger survived to see Oxbow's men destroy Gant, but he was not able to reimpose his rule on the other warlords. Krucharch had to ban them for patrolling to stop the fighting in the area. They nearly lost the region, Lord Therion added. My liege was preparing my 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 liege was preparing to send several grand regiments to root them out when the Heptarch sent a legion to quell the fighting. These three free com companies have been there since then. That's why Krachark's silent, because he's afraid of an internal war among his servants. Yes, Andoran replied. The alliance of the Heptarchs is too weak for them to permit one of their number to have sole access to the Book of Sages. They would war like dogs over it, and the other pettybanes would fall upon them like an avalanche. We considered exposing this information for that exact result, but we had no way to do it secretly. They would disregard the information out of hand. I assume he means if it wasn't done secretly. And we feared that such a war would cause the Bane Lord to rouse himself from exile. De Doran added, and Doran agreed, and the briefing continued for over another hour as all contingencies were reviewed. The next morning, Andoran, disguised as a messenger, rode with a platoon of scouts from the insertion column to the main body of the Grand Regiment so he missed the first scout's report when they returned. Captain, there's an enemy unit ahead. They will intercept us in less than a day at most. They, acquire, they appear to be a regular patrol. Strength and composition? Five to six score. They send out no individual scouts, and they travel on foot at great speed. The column's captain was silent. The lack of scouts here would be characteristic of only one kind of warrior. His second-in-command did not hold his tongue. We should not see them for two more days. Why would they be here so early? It doesn't matter, the captain said. Inform Captain Lelebrin and prepare to deploy the decoy platoons. The missioners deployed within the hour from the column. 
Disguised as a heavy, long-range scout platoon, they headed into the Kilia, with another platoon going after them and a third coming behind to mask the trail. The undead patrols would see this passage, but this was not something that they would remark upon, as the King's Guard had been sending scout platoons into the region for decades. The missioners were openly hiding, counting on routine to cover them. The Legionnaires did little about the patrolling other than stagger their patrol routes to try and hinder the scouts. The scouts caused no damage, and the undead did not want to risk getting caught by a battalion or perhaps a grand regiment of the King's Guard. Their orders were to keep the region quiet. The last thing they wanted was a full-blown battle with the elite soldiers of the Iron and High Kings. This was how the King's Guard had mapped the undead patrol routes, maps that were now useless. Forced to deploy ahead of schedule, Oxbow led them toward the first targeted tunnel entrance by an entirely different route than anticipated. Lelebren at first was worried about this, but the old hunter's memory of the terrain was encyclopedic, and 30 years before his mastery of it had been entire. Within two days, they were halted in a ravine less than an hour's march from the first cavern entrance. There they waited as the scouts Lelebrand had sent, including Curtis, did not come back. Oxbow moved about, calming everyone. Steady, boys. The ground here's awful rough. They're just taking it careful. Owen took the time to ask Mage Wilmer something that he'd been wondering about. Why do mages arm themselves with staffs? I thought that wizards were forbidden blades, but every one of you has a short sword and a dagger upon his belt, as well as a pocket knife. So why staffs at all? If, you, if we were forbidden blades, Owen, Mage Wilmer replied, we could not even have the pocket knife. Some wizards do forgo them. It helps some, some studies. Then he paused for a second or two, thinking of the best way to answer. In this, he was typical of his profession, weighing the words he used to answer a simple question as heavily as those he would use for a battle weird. The staff has a double significance, Owen, and he compared staffs to swords in explanation. Finally, a sword hath fewer uses, Owen, added Otharon, the chief elven wizard, then they began to review Owen's lessons in history. Inevitably, however, their thoughts returned to the three scouts, Curtis, Doran, and Brandor, and what was taking them so long. Night came, and even Oxbow became anxious, but the coming of dawn found the three warriors back at the rough campsite. Brandor began to report without preamble. Trolls, so this entrance is no longer a secret, he said. One of the warlords has been ordered to have the entrance guarded. We heard them grumbling about it as we watched the guards change twice. Is there any chance that the guarding will be abandoned? Lelebrun asked. None, Didoran replied. It wasn't begun less than a week ago. They shall be at it for days, if not weeks. Then we must destroy them, Therian said. No, we mustn't, Curtis said with absolute bluntness. Lord Therian looked at the old sergeant, astonishment plain upon his face. There are three of them. Oh, we could take them, I don't doubt, but how many of us will get killed over it? Men we'd need if things get furry in the castle. More to the point, we'd only have twelve hours, maybe less, before the next shift came. Even if we hid the bodies, they'd look for them. War trolls aren't in the habit of deserting their units. Twelve hours ain't enough time. Lelebrin concurred with the sergeant, and Oxbow led them away via the broken gulches, gullies, and ravines, leading them deeper into the Kilia's lightly forested lava scape. After a hurried day and a half of moving cautiously to avoid the Legion patrols, they came to the second entrance, or rather the spot that they would wait at while the entrance was scouted. Lelebrand sent Dedoran, Brander, Builder, and Tilder 
ahead this time to look at the targeted point. Other scouts were placed more closely to watch for the patrols, and this was the first time that Owen ever saw a legionnaire. It was more than a quick look. Tildur, the last of the far scouts, was barely out of view when Owen, hiding in the thicket next to a tree, saw a company of legionnaires come from behind him to his left and fifty odd more come from in front and to his right. The two units turned toward each other and not more than sixty yards in front of him they halted, giving Owen a golden opportunity to study them. They were within inches of each other's height, none less than five feet ten or more than six feet two. The gear they carried was exactly what the sergeants and wizards had said they would carry, round shields that were nearly four feet across, leaving only the head and a slight amount of neck above the rim, and yet a bit of shank and the feet below it, and just a bit of shank and the feet below it. Their helmets were round on top, with nose, chin, neck, and cheek guards that made it look like the helms were poured over their heads, leaving only the eyes and mouth exposed. All of them had heavy packs, which carried nothing but tools and extra weapons. Each of them wore corslets of several metal plates mounted on a leather jerkin that covered front and back and the upper arm, ending at about the elbow. All of them had arm guards on their forearms. Their torso armor ended in a metal-plated skirt that nearly reached to the knees, and all wore guards that covered the front and sides of their legs from the knee to the ankle. All of them wore iron shoes. The one lack of uniformity was that many of them wore chain beneath their legion armor, and those soldiers were covered completely from head to toe. Owen wished all of them were so dressed, for the others were the ones whose flesh he could see, and he would have rather not. Its appearance was profoundly revolting. It was not what he expected. All the talk of corpses had made him think of mummies, gangrene, skeletons, or even something rotten like the fentrolls. Owen had to swallow back his bile. Their flesh looked undecayed and whole, but drained of life, that is, of natural life. Their eyes, what little he could see of them, felt evil, was the only word for it, with a shade of darkness in the iris that had never been intended for the eye of, of man. Each one looked like they'd been dead for a day or two in a cold land. They were not frozen, but they hadn't rotted or been embalmed. Their physical appearance somehow conveyed spiritual abomination, and Owen felt horrified and dirty just seeing them. Abruptly, Owen realized that he had been concentrating on their appearance to the point that he had ignored their actions. The ones from the north had mingled with the larger group from the south, and they had formed triangles, a legionnaire standing at each point. Wordlessly, they began to pivot in unison, first in one direction, then in its reverse, and then in a complex dance that led to two legionnaires in each triangle to spin in a direction as the third spun in counter. At the end of each turn, they paused, facing in after one turn, and then facing out after the next. Face in, face out, turn left, turn right, turn right and left, turn left and right, face in, face out. The sequence repeated endlessly. What are they, line dancing? Finally, one triangle of the undead halted, and within two more turns, every legionnaire had stopped. Two of the legionnaires from the first triangle began speaking, and the undead again divided into two units. One a company of slightly more than a hundred, the other a platoon of more than fifty. The platoon headed south approximately on the same route upon which the company had arrived, and the company headed north along the route the platoon had used. The two units marched quickly out of sight, much more quickly than they had marched before. For several dozen heartbeats, Owen did not dare to move, not until he saw De Doran and the three dwarven scouts returning. Standing up, he barely suppressed a scream as a hand came from behind him and covered his mouth. Shh, Sergeant Wilmer whispered. 
they may still be in earshot, and sound travels far this close to sunset. Suddenly, Owen realized that they had less than an hour before night. It had seemed only moments ago that the undead arrived, but more than four hours had passed since he had taken his post. Wilmer started speaking again, still quietly. I felt them come, and I thought it best to see if you were well hidden. For some reason, he put his hand on his chest, grimacing in discomfort. Bastards, using their mockery of the ancient rite of soul to harmonize their bond to strengthen them, he spat in disgust. Remembering that Wilmer had survived the Legion sickness, Owen owed and stayed silent, waiting for the scouts to join them. Having those undead around is certainly becoming unpleasant, Brander noted, and is one more reason why this point will do us no good. Perhaps Oxbow and Curtis could remember more. We may need them. What were they doing? Owen asked. They were sharing their bonds, Brander replied, multiplying their power by sharing and combining it. Never did I expect that here. More than that, Captain Brander, Sergeant Wilmer pointed out, they exchanged troops. The ones from the south all had double-edged broadswords when they arrived. The company that headed north had half its number carrying single-edged scimitars. Lelebrun listened to the report of the scouts and the sentries quietly, though he did seem to deflate a little at De Doran's description of the ravine that had the second entrance in it, now blocked by a landslide. He did not say anything, however, until their report spoke of the legionnaires. A platoon and a company, he asked. Yes, Captain, Sergeant Wilmer affirmed. Fifty-three and one hundred eight. They shared their bonds and exchanged forces, with the command elements staying the same. Exchanged forces? Lelebrin shook his head in horror over this. Owen, Brander, Builder, Tilder, De Doran. Could any of you confirm this? Did you see the same? They most, most certainly shared bonds, De Doran confirmed. But we scouts returned to the straightaway after they had arrived. Save Tilder. I do not think any of the rest of us could speak as to their original compositions. Brander concurred, and Lelebrin quickly turned to Tilder. Canst thou speak to their original compliments, Tildor? The dwarf opened his mouth and then closed it again. Slowly he spoke. I cannot say with certainty, Captain. Then please speak with uncertainty. Forgive me, good dwarf. Shocked, Til Tildor looked to Brander, his father, as the dwarven characteristic hatred of Im imprecision fought his dwarven respect of authority. Though trained, he was new to soldiering and had not yet experienced combat. Do it, the dwarf captain said. He is asking you to give your best assessment, not to exaggerate or lie. The profession of the warrior can require this, he said to his son in a voice that was surprisingly gentle. Tilder grimaced. Dwarves truly hate imprecision, which could be very deadly underground. I think the sergeant is correct. I think they did exchange forces. Nodding as he sat before them, Lelebrun turned to Owen. What didst thou see, Bo's, Bo's son? Startled that he had been brought into the conversation, Owen nearly jumped. I saw fifty come, fifty some come from the north, and about a hundred come from the south. They mixed, formed triangles, and spun around a lot. Sometimes they were all spinning in one direction or another, sometimes not. And I guess they spun for hours. I lost track of time. Owen shrugged sheepishly, missing Wilmer. Look at him, oddly. When they were done, two from one triangle started talking, and they broke up, fifty-some heading south and the rest heading north. Sorry, I forgot to count them, he said, slightly abashed. And did they exchange forces? Owen thought it, about it for several seconds. Yeah, they did. I didn't realize it until Wilmer, he stuttered at Curtis's, mild frown er sergeant wilmer said they'd done it but he said it and i realized that that's what was bugging me they traded troops sir he added at curtis's second frown captain does that mean you doubt w what the sergeant reported wilmer and curtis both bristled but lelebrin calmed them with a wave of his hand 
Owen, captains must know what occurreth. All pieces of information should be confirmed when possible. The bond sharing hath great importance and the exchange of troops even more, he st stated. Curtis clarified it. That means they're trading troops not just outside their free companies, but outside their original legions. That's rarer than an, an antlered doe. Captain, if two of the companies split into two platoons, they've increased the area they can cover by about two-thirds. That ought to explain why they seem to be everywhere and out of their routes to boot. Indeed, Sergeant Curtis, wouldst thou and all of thy kind withdraw for a brief time, we of the elder races, races need to confer privately. Once outside, the men of the mission, including Taurus, who barely had any elven blood, sat down. Not wanting to wait any longer, now that it was fresh on his mind again, Owen spoke. How do you fight legionnaires with swords? Do you just cut them up? He blushed. Seeing them made me think them golems weren't training enough. I understand, Wilmer said. Cut off their sword arm and then their shield arm, not just their blades, but not just their blades can pass the distemper. Run them through the heart, then behead them, cut off their heads. He clarified at Owen's frown over the word. That kills them then, Owen said, not a question. No, Wilmer replied, shaking his head. That depends on the strength of the legionnaire, of his unit, of his banners, of his captain. It'll defeat most of them. He paused for a moment and then answered the question from a different direction. The bond enslaves the soul and it uses their flesh as part of the trap, like a lake surrounded by its own ice. The soul, the mages say, is strongest in the head and heart. So run them through the heart, take their heads. Burn them in a hot fire. A candle won't do it. Be careful of their armor. It is less about protecting the legionnaire than trapping your blade so he can stab you. Take their flag, Braster added. No banner's the worst number to see. No banners? What? No, both Wilmers and Curtis said. Seven banners is the worst number to see in a single company. Curtis finished alone. Braster paled as Sergeant Wilmer nodded grimly as the rest of the gu King's Guards looked sick. Why? Oxbow asked, but Curtis only shook his head. To all of them, the silence that fell felt oppressive. Ten minutes later, Lelebrun sent one of the elves to bring them. They still had sentries. The other fifteen members of the original platoon had been assigned the duty of escorting their extra horses back out of the Kilia. Under their Captain Lelebrin led it only for the mission. They would lead the horses that were no longer needed back to the Grand Regiment. This was the final part of the plan to decoy the undead patrols. When all the twenty-nine men of the mission were gathered, including the mages, the two lords, and Taurus, Lelebrin began. Two of our three potential entry points have been rendered useless. The point we sought today hath been buried by an avalanche. So, with two of the targeted points gone, our intelligence on the legionnaires now obsolete, and the lack of intelligence of the two objectives, I feel compelled to ask, shall we carry on? Aldemar answered first. If we bear up on this, the Crown Prince will order the Grand Regiment to do it. The book is that important. Lars was next. As mages, we would not turn aside from studying this book, since no wizard will ever again be brought into the legions. I think we should let the other men decide. They have the most to risk. Okay, I think... Oh, fuck. Okay. Six pages to go. And how's my sound? My sound is still good. Okay. That thought startled everyone coming from Wellman, but its validity could not be dismissed. Curtis spoke for himself and Oxbow. 
I'm too old for him to make much use of me. I'll go. This had no bearing in truth. The legions could recruit a man of any age, but it broke the tension of the moment. And if we win and they take me, it'll mean I can laugh all the longer. This even made some of the platoon chuckle. If I could, I'd avoid going, Sergeant Wilmer said. But Mage Aldemer's right. If we don't do it now, we'll do it later. I'd rather do it with surprise. And this many wizards, dwarves, and and elves. The rest of the soldiers nodded. The same situation applied to them. I would in any case, Tara said. Only a small group of us was going to enter the dragon's lair. But what about you, Owen? Me? Yes, you. You are the newest swordsman, and so the most vulnerable. What do you think? The captain gave his inter... The word was not one used commonly in, in the fence. Interpretation, Lelebrun supplied. Thanks, Captain. Interpretation of the vision. Master Andoran thinks I've seen it, too. If... If what I saw was the same thing, I know leaving them with the book, he nodded vaguely northwestward, is a bad idea. I'll go. Lelebrun decided to stay there for the night, guessing from experience that it would be at least a day before the next Legionnaire rendezvous occurred. He let them sleep late, taking advantage of the opportunity. Before noon, they broke camp and cleared as much of their sign as possible. Taras started preparing his group and the reserve team in case he failed. So at his direction, he, Owen, Lord Therian, and seven of the dwarves were put on stealth rations to reduce the odor that their bodies produced. After eating a large quantity of asparagus, they were restricted to eating plain jerky, broccoli, and an herb Owen did not recognize while drinking nothing but distilled water cut with vinegar. Okay. Taurus said this diet would greatly reduce the stench of their sweat once the asparagus was purged from their systems. When Brander noted that no elves or mages were being prepared to go into the lair, Taurus simply said that this process just makes elves stink more to a drake, and full mages are nearly as hard to hide. With the preparation of Taurus' Taurus's lair teams, the rest of the mission, missioners began their preparations for specific assignments. The individual captains, who were the strike team leaders, readying their groups. Once they had entered the tunnels, the 15 men of the platoon not assigned to the mission would then be released to their decoy duty, still pretending to be the whole unit. Dedorin and four others would stay with the war horses. Taurus would lead the first attempt to penetrate the lair with four dwarves. Owen would be his backup, with three dwarves and Lord Therian, who could speak Drakish more fluently than Owen. The other 31 warriors would be slotted to go to the castle via the tunnels, once Oxbow had shown Taurus which tunnel to use. Initially, though, Lelebrun would keep a reserve aside from Taurus's second group. The initial castle team would be 15 strong and would be led by Brandor with three of the mages in that squad. Seven of the mages would stay in the reserve with Lelebrun that Lelebrun kept as they could be utilized at the castle, lair, or the herd watch. For communications, the mages would speak to each other over minor distances, could speak to each other, and the dwarves had a signal hammer. This way, Lelebrun could at least receive messages from his two mission teams and respond accordingly. But once they reached the tunnels before they were fully deployed, Oxbow was in charge. He would also take command when they headed through the caverns to the oldest slave mine. If they headed to the mine, Lelebrun would signal Dedoran, and his group would take the mounts back to the column. Curtis, you realize that if this entrance is blocked or guarded, the game's up, Sergeant Wilmer said pessimistically. Characteristically, Curtis rolled his eyes as he responded.
Will, you're a barrel of cheer. Of course, it'll be meaningless if we can't get in. I've been trying not to think about it. The warlords found most of our other tunnel entrances. They traveled slowly three more days, gingerly through the broken lands, sticking to ravines that Oxbow pulled from long-abandoned but never forgotten memories, going at a crawl in some places to avoid the legionnaires. At last they came to the ravine with the last entrance, just before dark. Because of the twilight, Lelebrin waited until after sunset before having two scouts examine the small dale. It took two hours, but they came back, reporting all clear. Dismounting less than twenty yards from the entrance, the party started performing maintenance chores. The men and elves saw to the horses and gear while the dwarves entered the tunnel itself, checking it for obstructions. When they reported it ready, the forty-six members of the mission and the fifteen platoon members who were the remount escorts unloaded the pack animals and began stowing the extra equipment they had brought, taking it into the tunnels. Lelebrin had been prepared for the possibility of having to free the fort's new slave population, and they had brought many spare packs of weapons and other supplies. There's no point to me sleeping out here and then having to get used to the tunnels tomorrow, Oxbow said, when the gear was inside. Seeing the sense in this, the mission men entered as, as well once the horses were hobbled, the gear stowed, and the ravine magically camouflaged. The elves stayed outside with the four men who would watch the animals and the decoy escort. Dedoran would stay with Curtis, but the other six elves wanted to enjoy the night sky and would wait until dawn before entering. Curtis, Rorhan, Thal, and Arthur took advantage of this, getting one more night of sleep before the elves entered the tunnels. At the fortress, the sorcerer Brask received a summons. Yes, Lord Despair. Okay, so we've completely changed. We jumped to... The fortress. Okay. Yes, Lord Despair, he said to the apparition of the flesh demon. The High King is aware of our prize. The wardens have contacted him. I believe that an attack is imminent. The wardens. How unfortunate that they have not been eliminated. The doings of my antique, unenlightened brethren concern you only as far as I see fit to warn you. The internal differences of angelic kind are certainly not for a lesser being like you to voice an opinion. Is that clear? Yes, Lord Despair, we will be wary. Excellent, the apparition faded. When it was gone, Brask immediately destroyed the crystal that had projected the Hlemiox image. Lesser being, he shall regret that when imps like him are replaced by my children. And when and when we can raise more legionnaires, another voice joined in. It was the captain of the undead unit that had just joined Brask's garrison. But for now, steady, mage. Such thoughts are for the future. We are not anointed by the Bane Lord yet. The corpse man stepped forward into what had been the apparition's view. He looked like he'd drowned, but his armor was spotless, and his gait spoke of millennia of soldiering. How do you want to proceed? His detached unity unit was nominally under Brask's authority. Brask knew that that was a bone thrown to him only because he had been right in finding the book. Still, for now, it was enough that the legionnaire asked him for orders. The affectations of power would come in time. He considered the question for the moment as he brought his emotions under control. Send messengers requesting more orcs from Krauger and trolls. He will not give them to us, but the step needs to be taken. I agree, the captain said. Shall we warn the drake? Brask made a negating gesture. I will do that if it becomes necessary, but he will give us no aid. Nor would I expect him to, the undead concurred. 
Speaking of needed steps, may I recommend that you have your apprentices restrain their castings. Some of them are not subtle, and the weakest wizard of the weakest robe could sense what they are doing. An excellent point. I will implement it immediately. Could you suggest anything else? Having a legion captain be polite to you meant being polite in turn. We could send out patrols. Brask had already decided against that. No, any attack to seize our prize will be just as likely to strike team as a grand regiment. Despair and Brawn have added their unit to the ones that were already out there. If they cannot find them, no patrol we sent could. More likely, it would open a gap that would let any raiders through, unless you ordered your command to patrol. Okay, just checking. The captain made his own negating gesture. My command has been here less than a month. I do not think we should reveal ourselves yet. Surprise is the last advantage that one should ever abandon. The only other option I see at this point is to order or ask Drakes to patrol the area. Brask shook his head. The Drakes we have here are not ready for that, and I do not want the rest of their kind to know that we have been what we have been attempting. Are we secure against infiltration? As sure, secure as can be expected, was the captain's reply. My command is not a fam as familiar with this fort as I would like, but with my command, the orcs and your sorcerers, we should do well if anyone attacks. What if it is a grand regiment that comes, though? They would have enough numbers that even despair could not oppose them, nor my lord captain. Then may... They may call us for aid if they need it, if they need it. <sighs> How? You just broke the last summoning stone in the castle. Brass looked at the remains of the destroyed stone. What an unfortunate coincidence, he said soberly. The captain started to laugh, a fully evil and shrewd sound. There is more light down here than I expected. Okay, so we jumped again. There's more light down here than I expected, Taurus said, as Octopo led them through the galleries. Some light gets down here through breaks in the surface. As slaves, we had to polish stones to reflect what light there was. Some things, mosses and such, glow in the dark, and we use them too. This is where we'll part company, Mr. Taurus, Octopo said, pointing to a particular tunnel of the junction, half a mile or more from the tunnel entrance, though it was more or less straight into the hill from it. That gallery leads to the dragon's lair. Taurus inhaled deeply. Yes, I can smell it. Where is the gallery to the mine? This way, Oxbow replied, and led them for several minutes further on, roughly northward in direction. This gallery was also fairly straight from the tunnel entrance, but it then turned westward and sharply down. It passes underneath the lair, then turned northwest. Very good. Now, just to be sure, let me see if I can return us to the lair gallery. He took more time than Oxbow had used, but Taurus brought them back safely. Well done, Mr. Taurus, Oxbow said. These tunnels aren't that difficult to spelunk. Thank you, though. These ones aren't, no. The ones over to the castle can get real hairy. Let's head that way now. You, got, you ought to know how to head that way if things go wrong. He led them back to another tunnel and turned up to, up, up it. Twenty minutes later, and it came to a dead end. Stopping, he breathed deeply and muttered the password Randy had set to end, to end the weird decades before the wall of stone in front of them and the weird holding it together released at last as the illusion and wall of dust in front of them dissolved a stench of ancient decay assaulted their nostrils a he died randy the mage that my band had 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 with us he taught the password to release the weird he'd put on this gallery we were being chased, and we couldn't let the orcs in with us. 
There were too many, and we'd a lot of helpless folks in the, in the main tunnels, wounded and women folk with kids. The tunnel reeks of blood and death, long since decayed away, one of the dwarves noted. Oxbow nodded, though only the elves and dwarves could see the motion. Yeah, it oughta. Twelve of uh, our men stayed behind in here to slow them down. We think that over 200 orcs were caught on that side of the wall. They might have made it out, but Anders himself was with the boys who stayed behind. He had a price on his head, big enough to make an orc swear off torture. Perhaps they collected a small sum when they returned re reporting his death. Oxbow shook his head. No, when Randy sealed this end, he caused the other to seal up too. Taurus and the four dwarves with him returned to the main tunnel and went to the den where Lelebrin had set up his headquarters. Quickly, professionally, they sorted through their gear, leaving what may, would be useless for underground combat or travel, and spares that they could use to replace whatever would be destroyed in their incursion. When Taurus led them back to the tunnel that led to the dragon's lair, Lelebrin, or then Taurus led them back, Lelebrin, Brander, and Oxbow saw them off. We will leave markings should any need to follow us, Taurus said, stating the obvious. We will do the same, Brander replied. No offense taken at the statement. All plans become suspect after the first hammer stroke. Be careful, Oxbow said. The tunnels we'll use ain't the only ones to get to the places that we want to go. Just the easiest. I can't swear that orcs or such ain't found that orcs or such ain't found them out. Taurus nodded, and Lelebrin spoke an ancient elven benediction. Our God speed thee well, Taurus. Taurus showed his bow, uh, Taurus bowed his neck again. Then Lelebrin, Oxbow, and Brander headed back to prepare the other mission strike teams. <sighs> That one, I'm sorry, that one felt like a little bit of a slog. Um, but it is done. That's the end of the chapter. That takes us to chapter 8, Tunnels to Keep. Um, and it is a little shorter. It's only 13 chapters. So next time will be... A short read unless the next one is short as well let's see I don't think it is no the next one is actually a bit long so next time will just be a real short read probably 30 minutes we'll get into that next Wednesday for now let's see who's doing what Shall we raid somebody? We haven't raided in a, a few sessions. Um, we've got, let's see, Vesper, Count BB. Um, Big Blue. Uh, you know what? Let's go see what this channel is doing. Up, giving it back to you. Yeah, so it's really awesome. And it also means you get a little bit of a discount no. on yeah. merchandise. We're going go to go to Vesper. See, Home Vesper. Explorer lets so you easily compare home insurance options so you can get, get what you need over without there. overpaying. Bear yeah, with me a, a minute. And oh, yeah, see really there. high end stuff. Sorry, that's our ghost. Don't lie, don't lie, don't lie. It's more But it's camera time. You said take the picture. But you rolled your eyes. Let's see if we can see this. Yes, I'm like, I always say, take the fireplace. What's she free from? Here we are, fireplace. I'll just take one back. I'll just take one back.